Thank you. Welcome everyone and thank you for attending our first workshop out of the series of sessions that we have planned over the next three months. Uh, the intent is to demystify data science in healthcare and help you create real impact within your organization. I'm Manisha Bafna and I head customer success for data science at GTS Tech. I will be a moderator for today. I'm joined by Sridhar Turaga. He's the senior vice president uh, and manages data science, consulting, and digital innovation at GTS Tech, as well as Swanand Prabhupadendulkar, who's a senior vice president data, uh, and responsible for data management at GTS Tech. They'll be sharing their thoughts on next generation data management to the power of data science. Swanand has helped many of our clients navigate through the journey of data man management and interoperability over the past 15 years. So you can say he's seen a lot in this space in terms of you know interoperability, you know, scaling and growing right from, right from the HL7 to fire days. Sridhar comes with experience in scaling data science globally across industries. So you can see he brings fresh ideas and new questions into the space. There's a growing need of incorporating data science as a default design consideration while developing modern data warehouse platforms. And while managing healthcare data and performing advanced analytics, algorithms like NLP, data privacy, et cetera, are becoming critical to data management in any healthcare environment. Few do's and don'ts uh, for the session today. Uh, all participants are going to be on mute. And feel free to type in your questions or queries on the chat box during the session, or you could even email us the queries using the email ID, which will be shared at the end of the session. We have reserved 15 minutes to answer as many queries as we can. Uh, so with that, let's dive into our first knowledge session on managing healthcare data through the power of data science. Over to you, Sridhar. Thank you, Manisha. So over the next uh, 20 to 25 minutes, Swanand and I will uh, discuss uh, and share four key things with you. Uh, and hopefully, we'll have uh, you know a discussion around questions you have after that. Firstly, I'll try and make an argument on why we need to, in some ways, think about data management a little bit differently uh, because and of data science as an input, as an output. The second thing is I'll try and articulate a few of the traps to avoid because data science uh, is, is a topic, AIML is a topic which is, brings a lot of exciting possibilities but also comes with quite a bit of hype. Uh, and I'll try to articulate a few of the traps that you know we, we think of avoiding. Um, we'll then share a conceptual framework on how you want to think about it. But more importantly, we will talk about four examples, real life experiences that you know, we are currently you know, going through with some of our customers. Um, the first um, you know, uh, starting point of this whole discussion is quite obvious. There is a whole range of new, interesting, complex, difficult data uh, in healthcare. Uh, this is not new you know, uh, in, in one sense. And in, you will probably recognize each of the use cases listed here. But a couple of things are changing quite rapidly and uh, you know from each of these contexts you can pick any one of these that's relevant to your business your uh, view of the world but essentially if you look at everything across the board um, firstly a lot of computational capability and algorithm access in dealing with these data sets has become more um, uh, you know feasible today the simplest and the most common example is uh, natural language processing, entity extraction. This is a topic that people have been at for a long time. You know, progress has been slow. There is a lot of you know car wreckage in the past, but but recently some of the algorithms and techniques are are making a lot more progress than ever before and much more accessible than in the past. So that's one of the reasons why while this data has always existed. People have talked about it as gold mine of information. It's been very hard to extract. So that is one source of what is changing. The second reason why uh, this becomes important from a data management perspective is that 
as organizations adopt more and more data science as a part of their decision making process as a part of their intelligence systems as a part of their analytics roadmaps uh, the need to apply newer features uh, extract newer insights to make models more predictable and provide an insight that is normally not available is also becoming quite relevant so for both of these reasons many of these use cases are being revisited uh, by many of our customers uh, in addition to this which i generally put on the bucket of difficult data the first uh, topic at the top you we'll also find that there is need to rethink processing logic we we'll talk about one of the examples where we will we will articulate to you that when you extract for example snowmet classes and other structured data out of clinical notes it may contradict some of your structured data so you also want to think about interesting challenges of reconciliation the other challenge that data science always brings you know irrespective of how you use it that it is not very static the logic shifts as data shifts what is called as drift how do you then think about the underlying feedback loop and monitoring it's a much more dynamic logic if i may put it that way the third aspect which i touched upon briefly is that there's also need to deliver newer features data science algorithms are very feature hungry in some ways so there is also need to extract some interesting features out of this data which is also kind of creating the need for you to think about data management a little bit differently there is also certain questions which are still unclear for many of us which is a lot of prediction models are also feeding data back into the data warehouse which means that you need to account for probabilistic scores as well and how do you think about that and how does what does that do to mean use what does that do to data management and data dictionaries when you have probability scores associated with you know data elements and that's another dimension so these are some of the challenges because of which we are seeing a lot of rethink of how data management you know, happens from a broader sense just want to briefly touch upon some of the traps um, that you want to also avoid first and foremost everybody who attempts data science in the context of data management grossly underestimates the cost of creating reference data for all the promise of these algorithms algorithms are very data hungry and expect very clean data to be trained on so that every one of our customers we have seen grossly underestimate a lot of subject matter effort is also needed to validate the models which is also grossly underestimated none of the models you know work out of the box as many people claim to be multiple measures of accuracy measures of accuracy are sometimes context dependent explainability and traceability is a problem in the old world of etl rules are very clear you can understand and explain it but you start using data science algorithms to extract data then explainability and traceability becomes a bit of a challenge and and how do you work with data science teams and data science models is a bit of a uh, topic to think about i talked about drift and model degradation uh, unlike etl rules models deteriorate sometimes unpredictably covid has seen a lot of models predict Uh, you know deteriorate last but not the least the whole topic of reconciliation and confidence interval how do you design your schema for data points which are multiple and more importantly associated with probability so i'll now hand it over to swanan to talk a little bit about how do you kind of think about the broader architecture and then we'll jump into yes. examples up swanan all yours yes uh, so this this is the way uh, you know we we have been thinking uh, how how we can uh, you know process the data and uh, if you look at it on from a on a broader scale uh, well this is this is the way uh, you know data has always been processed correct so at the bottom you will and it is more of a bottom to top kind of a diagram at the bottom you will see the sources which are different different ones text and fire and ccds and extensions of the world on the top of it uh, in fact nowadays we have a streaming data as well correct so there could be an event hub which is getting streaming data there could be another way of getting batch data that's my integration layer on top of which comes my integration layer and integration layer would have various components starting from quality check for the data that is incoming uh so either i think okay fine this is so quality check for the data data that is coming in uh, then you need to do data mapping to your way of uh, storing it the reconciliation what we mean by that is uh, we are taking adverses of bit decision so you have got you are getting data from various sources and you will get the same kind of a record from two different places how do you do that transformation again comes up uh, from 
<laughs> if you have if you want to uh, you know come up with your own uh, adw or uh, it's your uh, old structure and that's exactly where a transformation comes so various things that come in between and on top of which uh, i mean the, the the standard way of looking at what uh, you know, data science will give you that comes up right on top of it so you might use things like nlps you might use things like image analytics you might use things like video analytics and so on and so forth correct you can also look at things like uh, figuring out if some data is missing or not uh, whether some data that you have been receiving uh, are you now still in the control of the data that you are seeing or you are kind of losing it all all of these things uh, those those are you know, slowly changing and are slowly changing trends and i believe uh, that's where my uh, data science folks come into picture and they keep telling me okay so you know what uh, last month uh, this was a profile of the data now this month this is the way we are looking at it i think there is some uh, there is something is to change or we need to go back to my sources and tell them that something has to has uh, you know change on your side or maybe uh, this is now going to be the new normal for the data and at, at the top of it this is exactly what the feedback that uh, Caesar was talking about keep checking uh, the, the data that you are seeing keep looking at data drift and keep uh, you know feeding it back there is one more aspect that i want to talk about and i think that will come up on the next slide as well that is it's not that data science always gives you output this is the way we are thinking now so uh, most of the time we feel that uh, you you give uh, a whole bunch of data run a lot of algorithms and then it will give something as output but it's not always an output in fact we are looking at the places where data science will give you input as well to your data so somebody gives you say notes data you extract certain information out of it and then augment that into your data itself now the output of that notes extraction becomes an input to you uh, and we just wanted to tell you that yes this is something that we have been seeing in fact happening a lot more that uh, you know from an input perspective itself data science is uh, you know helping us a lot so that if you can go to the next slide and I'll talk about some of the you know, considerations. So there are a lot of considerations, but for today, uh, for the time that we have, we thought we'd talk about four of them. So unstructured data, uh, I kind of touched upon this one. So you will be getting imaging, PDFs and notes and whatnot. And we can extract actual data out of it. When I say actual data, I mean the uh, you know for a data which can be looked at in a, in a table column fashion. Right? The good old table term. and then yes you can extract it and you can then augment that with your the the, the other you know, table column data fashion the next is data mapping itself so uh, there have been a lot of uh, you know, ETA tools we keep doing a lot of mapping but the biggest problem that we all know is to do the logical mapping so somebody tells me so this is a so this is a target what is the mapping which column maps to which one correct which entity maps to which one and that's exactly where uh, the, the bulk of the work starts because someone has to do the logical mapping and give me an Excel that this one maps here. And once I give that Excel to my developer, that guy will you know, finish his SIS or whatever other kind of work, maybe print or a talent kind of a work. But then the actual mapping has to come from somewhere and that's where uh, data, you know, data science can help. And we'll have a look at uh, one of the you know, case studies that we have seen. The next is data quality. So there have been many data quality tools around. They will look at your data. They will run quality rules. They let you, uh, you know, develop quality rules of your own. But you still need to know what data quality rules to run on. And what we are thinking is uh, you know, use data uh, data science to look at data and then figure out, okay, what could be uh, you know, the data quality rules itself that I need to apply for the data that I am coming up with. So, uh, one way to look at it is I, I uh, use a UI and create 50 data quality rules or my data science algorithm tells me, you know what, you need these 100 data quality rules. And then I can actually add on to it. That's fine. But uh, someone tells me that these are the quality rules that you require, correct? I might have probably missed out because I'm looking at it from my output perspective and looking at quality of the data. But uh, my uh, data science algorithm will actually look at it not from my output perspective, but it will just look at you know, outliers using the values and things like that. And the last one is data privacy and protection, and this is to do with uh, you know, our uh, anonymization and uh, data identification. So, uh, for 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 quite some time, data uh, uh, protection and uh, you know, data anonymization was more like a, uh, just make certain things null, certain things blank, certain dates uh, just make them first of Jan. But uh, now, if, uh, what happens is if you are going to share the data for some sort of a studies or some sort of uh, AI ML algorithm. Uh, you you can lose the parity of the information. So uh, I, I can't have uh, 
of a visit that has happened five months before my my birth date of birth or so. So parity has to be maintained, and for that uh, there are advanced methods for just to anonymize the data. Uh, you will get the data which is anonymized. So you cannot figure out who who the PHI owner was, but still. Uh, it will have a lot of parity and it can be useful for trend analysis and various other things. So, Sridhar, uh, can you go to the next slide? Uh, okay, uh, so this is more about how, how what we did for one of our customers using an unstructured text and uh, you know, fire resources. So, the, the objective was uh, my our client was getting uh, data in the form of fire resources, and uh, the way we have uh, everywhere else, we have fire, uh, fire parcel. What we do, we look at all the nodes and then we bring out all the entities and the attributes, store them in a table column fashion and, and the job is done. But then we started looking at things like there have been many nodes and we keep saying that. And now what data is lies in the nodes is something that we do not know. And that's exactly where uh, we had to put in what we call the clinical information accelerator. Uh, in fact, extractor, that is, it's, it's going to look at those nodes and then figure out if there are any Maybe diagnosis kept in the note. Somebody writes that okay, patient has DM or the patient has you know, BP of maybe 148. So maybe there is an observation which is hidden in the notes, or maybe there is a medication hidden in the notes, or maybe there is a you know, resign that is hidden in the notes. You know, go for walk, whatnot. So what we did was uh, we uh, gave them our uh, NLP extractor and uh, that whole we call it CIX, that is clinical information extractor. Uh, not only get the, the the empirical data the way we get it otherwise from a fire uh, parser, augment that data, augment the procedures and the diagnosis and the medication that we find in the handwritten notes uh, to the data that my parser actually works on. Once that is done, then go for a reconciliation. Figure out that okay, uh, this is what I have already find. Uh, I have already found now. I want to uh, take a decision whether I overwrite or I add and all of that. And then give them the final data. What it does is, uh, you know, it, it adds on something that is missed out in the empirical data. My customer wanted to do uh, clinical quality measures calculation, and this added data actually helps them uh, you know, achieve their clinical quality measures goals. So the precision that we found out out here was almost 85%. And we also gave them an annotation framework, which uh, you know figures out that if you want to translate this to maybe some other terminology, so you can do that. So that was more of a, uh, uh, the way we did it for them. If you can go to the next slide, I'll quickly touch upon how it was. So the, the, uh, this this architecture doesn't change too much from the architecture that we saw here, correct? What we had done here is we added an NLP service in between. An NLP service and an annotation framework does the magic of uh, you know looking at my text and figuring out what are the different diagnoses and all that I have to add. Uh, so data ingestion pipeline, everything works. And after that, we push in our NLP services, get the data, uh, get the extra data, augment it, and then give it for the rest of the use cases. That is, you know, de determine care gap, find uh, the HEDIS engine that they have, or to you know, send it for patient's care management, and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, Sridhar, can you talk a little bit more about the NLP services on the next slide? That will be actually helpful. Absolutely. So when we uh, embarked on this journey for this customer, there are three challenges which were rather unique and you may resonate with some of them. First of all, this is just part of a large existing data warehouse infrastructure and system that's been built over the last 10 years. So this is not a, a new initiative in a sense, it's an enhancement on what exists. So first of all, whatever we do has to kind of flow into the existing uh, you know, data flows of CCDAs and and other interoperability requirements that exist in that environment. The second challenge, which is I alluded to this in the trap, is that you know they didn't have the golden data or the reference data to train the algorithms in this context. So now, who will now bell the cat and you know, take the effort of training to eventually feed the algorithms is a challenge, and we encounter this quite often. Third, but not the least, you know one thing that a lot of people don't appreciate about NLP is that it is um, it is something that in some ways is very context and use case centric as well. So, so because this team was tasked with setting up the data infrastructure, they also had to kind of create this in some ways, keeping it ready to a use case agnostic manner, which is very challenging 
if you want to do this because in the context of a particular use case you can get very high accuracy but how do you architect it to be a little bit use case neutral by the broad use cases we're understood so in the next slide uh, i'll just show you the architecture and some of the innovation that that, that we could bring in um, you know you will notice this at the bottom it's a very peculiar architecture called model one model two where we are having a rules engine marrying a deep learning algorithm so so the way we uh, went about building this at the top is a standard nlp structure so i won't talk about that everybody does that but the interesting thing of what we did here was that we built a model one architecture where in some ways based on rules um, uh, you know which is a little bit more transparent easy for the subject matter expert to validate and seed the initial data set was the first version now, obviously once you go down the path of a rules based algorithm you are losing generalizability it is not as extendable as a pure you know deep learning algorithm we knew that choice however the interesting thing is that we also built the deep learning algorithm in parallel which was kind of taking the output of the rules based algorithm and feeding back into the deep learning model to algorithm so it's a very interesting structure and this is one of the design structures that we use quite often now to use get the ball rolling with a rules based algorithm if you don't have enough reference data and as the data evolves use the you know i would call it reference data to feed a more um, advanced machine learning algorithm which is much more generalizable and then eventually uh, the model 2 becomes the dominant model which is much more generalizable and much more extendable so this is one of the structure that we did which resulted in a lot of reference data as well the other thing of course is from a schema perspective we also had to take into account the fact that we don't yet have the use cases you know on place on day one so how do you then kind of take into account these reconciliation problem because reconciliation is very context sensitive for example some of the extractions from clinical notes were contradicting some of the structured data that was coming in um, you know from other objects then how do you kind of retain both and kind of reserve the decision to a later date so that's the structure that we took here and uh, and and it kind of yielded uh, you know very good results for us but more importantly we also married it to the existing architecture so in some ways the overall data management um, and and etl flows did not change very much we just kind of plugged in some of this into the existing flow so that was i think why it kind of took off for us so one yep absolutely uh, the next one is about data mapping, and uh, so this is this is uh, we have uh, one of the leading trial software providers, and uh, they partner with the life sciences uh, research organizations. And what happens is in their trial, uh, you know, the entire life cycle of trial, they will get data which is a raw format for the trials, and it has to undergo various transformations. So SDTM is is one thing that is you know, steady data tabulation model. There is another one that is ADM, which is uh, analysis data model. So without getting the gory details of what these are, so basically SDTM is more of a tabular data model. ADM is used for analytics for the trials. But uh, for, the, for the fun part is uh, they have to do so many data transformations. And then at the end, there will be TFL, and then that has to go to FTA. So ADM, TFL, all of this, uh, in some ways, we need to give it to FTA. So what is to happen is for every uh, every trial that they conduct, uh, this SDTM file will have two uh, you know, variables, maybe like 50, 60, 80, whatever. And then those needs to be transformed to ADM. Though, though SDTM and ADM both are kind of there, uh, the models have been around, but still every time they have to do the mapping. And what happens is uh, there, there could be things like uh, the data format is slightly different and hence uh, the mapping goes wrong or mapping needs to be done with a lot more care. And hence uh, there was a lot of opportunity for automation. So what we did was we worked with our customer and we gave them uh, a, a data mapper itself, which will look at uh, SDTM, which will look at uh, the variables that are required for that study and it will map it to ADM. Uh, what it will also do is it will uh, look at not only the, the text-based mapping, that is the name of the column and the name of the column here for the column there. It will also look at uh, the type of the column. It will also look at the values and it will uh, you know, then figure out, okay, this is the, the best match that I'm thinking that it should be there. 
it used to take a uh, you know, probably five days, six days, seven days only to do this mapping. And now, uh, you know, at least 80% of the mapping is done uh, by this algorithm that we have given to our customers. Uh, Sidhar, can you go to the next slide? And you know, that actually talks about, uh, yes. So the approach, I, I, as I said, right, analyze the study types, the data sets, not just uh, the, the name, but also look at the data and things like that. Uh, it has given us 80% process automation and it has given us a productivity of more than 75 percent gain so it's, it's been helping helping them so their their overall time to do mapping every time for every trial has reduced drastically and uh, also it has it has made them a lot more efficient that uh, you know you're not just looking at uh, just a column to column but also looking at data and and you know predicting okay this will not be a good match and that will be a good match this has been helping our client a lot so Caesar, if you have anything else to add on, uh, you. Yeah, I was just going to thank you, Swanand. I was just going to make a comment that this actually also overlaps with this concept of you know mapping to some extent. This was an example of just mapping the structure, but you know mapping entities is another topic where data science is also playing an important role. One of our customers, you know, manages over a million claims a week. Uh, that volume, one of the data elements in their data management process, which has been a perpetual problem, is how to map, you know, provider entities, provider location information. Now, automation got them up to the 85, 87% mark, which is typical rules-based, and this is massive manual operation resolving the differences of the last 13%, which is the, the last mile of automation, which they could never accomplish beyond a point with rules. So very similar to this particular example, we used you know, distance algorithms and, and classification to help the customer you know, do that mapping. You could think of it as a fuzzy match, think of it as you know, multi-dimensional match, which now push their level of automation to upwards of 95%. Now this is a very, um, in some ways, a very uh, simple problem when you think about it, that you have you know, millions of entities which uh, you know, for various reasons, location of a physician in two places or a clinic is slightly different and it's not matching. It's a painful problem that you only can reach a certain limit with automation. So that's another example, very close to this particular you know, technique and approach where we matched entities and, and achieved significantly higher you know, accuracy um, uh, and, and of course reduce the cost of operations. So it's kind of follows in the same class. Um, if I can go to the next example, um, this is in the in the realm of I would you know, as as one introduced this topic around you know quality checks and monitoring of data. This use case in this particular topic has of course implications way beyond you know data quality check and 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 monitoring for alerts because when you monitor for uh, errors and abnormalities, there are many other business applications as well. This is in the context of streaming devices. Now, obviously, everywhere with virtualization of care in, across various aspects of the healthcare spectrum, uh, the, there's a proliferation of devices. If you're a provider, you need to think about how to manage the streaming data coming in into your environment. If you're a life sciences company, it's a whole digital uh, you know, trials and device world. And in med tech companies that we work with, of course, do this both from serviceability and and their end customer experience perspective. So streaming data obviously is one you know, difficult data. Now, there's a whole range of issues with streaming data. And traditionally, when first obvious problem is it's it is it is patchy, the missing values often because of connectivity issues or unreliability of the underlying protocols, so just proliferation of protocols. So obviously, first obvious problem we are thinking about when you're dealing with streaming data is. How do you deal with data imputation? You know, at what extent can you fill the gaps? Um, because some of this data kind of feeds into you know, other data science models which are sensitive to, you know, to missing values. So that's the foundational case. If you go one level higher, a lot of these devices have a whole range of issues. You know, there's faults which sometimes lead to an error, which leads to a complete you know, you know, uh, you know, failure of the device or its underlying. You know, performance and that's kind of well understood and oftentimes there is enough understanding and rules that can be written to you know deal with that and then drive the underlying analytics related the hardest category is what is called an anomaly it's something is unusual 
something is abnormal it's very contextual either it is it happens as a as a as a as a significant spike that just happens once in a while but not not kind of persisting or only in a certain context um you know um, this is this is unusual this may this may be ignored in most cases but in certain context this is very unusual that you want to think about last but not the least um the other challenge with streaming data is that it is not just about one parameter or one data stream that's flowing in but your multiple data streams flowing in and what is unusual is often determined you know by multiple data streams need to be correlated and and kind of determined as an abnormal an abnormal data point or abnormal trend now some of you may turn around and say now are you going beyond data management now you now talking about building data science models and in fact that is the dilemma you know of this whole discussion which is that uh, in some ways data science is of course helping deal with difficult data and extract new insights and new features but but underlying models that are built um, uh, to use some of the data also cre is creating new data uh, this is going back to many years ago when data warehousing was conceptualized because this proliferation of analysis across the organization and there's no single source of truth in some ways proliferation of data science is creating that same problem all over again that many of us saw 15 years ago where new information is being created across the organization and and that's kind of needs to be kind of in some ways standardized to some extent now here what we have uh, also dealing with and this is direct implication to um you know how you think about data quality management you know one of the challenge in just relying on rules is that if more scenarios more events and more hidden patterns exist in data then you kind of are forced to you know eventually write the rules somebody has to write the rules whole promise of what we are trying to do here and we call it adaptive monitoring is how do you for example determine what is unusual the control limits what is a unusual pattern of data how does this pattern of data you know look an unusual compared to another pattern of data that is happening in parallel that's the context in which we are monitoring you know some of this device data you know flowing in and and it's it's also from a quality perspective we are monitoring it but we are also obviously monitoring from a you know performance perspective of some of this underlying data if you remember i talked about model 1 model 2 architecture you will notice here that the rules based extraction and monitoring is feeding into the adaptive monitoring and adaptive monitoring is feeding into the rules engine why are we doing that the reason why we are doing that is eventually you know for practical reasons for manageability explainability audit trail you want rules you you I, I, we at least are of the belief that there won't be a time when data science algorithms will replace rules and it will they'll figure these out automatically first of all that is mathematically like not possible it's an unbounded problem in one sense but more importantly it is also unmanageable for organizations to have algorithms that are black box you know spitting out abnormalities in processing given that they are very dynamic so what we are doing in this case is that we are using adaptive monitoring not to find the abnormalities but to bubble up rules that need to find the errors so in a way the adaptive monitoring algorithm is a rule generator it is not the actual quality processing layer but it is a rule generator which in turn of course works in a standard you know etl process so that actually has helped our customer um you know kind of in some ways retain the current team current technology current processes so we are not kind of lock stock and barrel replacing that but on the side the intelligent engine is generating new rules which can be fed back into the existing structure the other interesting thing that we are doing here is we are also monitoring the current rule usage as you know you know in any system there's lots of logic that's been written and lot of logic sometimes you know kind of dies out or is not active anymore or sometimes may contradict so in some ways the engine is also monitoring usage of rules and kind of giving you analytics around which rules are actually catching errors and which are not and why aren't these rules not as active anymore so that's the design construct that we are using here this is the broad architecture that's applicable for any streaming data but you will notice that within the standard structure which i'm sure all of you have and have seen before we've kind of plugged in this uh, intelligence of adaptive monitoring 
uh, as I said, both from an input data perspective, but also from a device performance uh, you know, perspective. The next example, the last example I want to talk about is this topic of you know, privacy and protection. Now, this is another topic that is obviously under the realm of data management, but is also some of the assumptions are changing and, and you are now being challenged to deal with new questions around that. Why is that happening? There are two topics which you know, anonymization, data identification, security data generation are also in the realm of this topic. And this is something that a lot of our customers responsible for data management are also kind of becoming accountable for. Whatever be the use case, you need to share data, you need to monetize data, you need to share data in a safe manner, you need to use data to build data science models. How do you kind of protect that data? As Swanan mentioned in his comments, in the past, it was okay to eliminate the PHI columns and kind of use a simple safe harbor methodology, scramble a few columns, and it was good to go. Once you get to applying data science use cases on your data, because you're now making decisions using that data and not just uh, using it for testing purposes, now you're stuck with a fundamental balance between re-identification risk and utility. Many of the standard data management techniques that we have used over the last 10 years actually sacrifice utility of the data for safety. The question that will come in front of you, if it hasn't as yet, is how do you balance this utility of data with re-identification risk and can you actually quantify it? So this is broadly the topic of expert determination. The other one which is a very um, uh, uh, related topic is synthetic data generation. You know, every one of you probably serves not just the production data, which sometimes has to be made available for software development or new areas of development, but also in and around you know, test data or other data sets that are necessary to enable software development or maybe even analytics for that matter. So the other area we are seeing tremendous momentum in some of our data management customers is, you know, how do I generate synthetic data that is a clone of my production data, um, not just, uh, not just obviously, you know, snapshot data, but even transaction data. And then how do I kind of support that as well? So these are in some ways, you know, kind of intersection between data management and data science, and it's kind of hard to determine, you know, where it belongs, but this is something that uh, data management teams are accountable for. By the way, a lot of cloud migration uh, being attempted for taking the power of some of these algorithms and computational capability requires de-identification and synthetic data generation. Some of you may also want to kind of explore where synthetic data generation can be used as a foundation for building underlying models. Um, so this is the kind of the balance that you want to think about. Uh, and, and, and I don't want to go into the math behind the expert determination and some of what we do here, but there are some really powerful open source you know, components that we are using like ARX. And more importantly, we are integrating them into the traditional enterprise data management, data warehouse infrastructure and cloud integration infrastructure and kind of you know, uh, putting traditional layers of microservices and monitoring on top of it with the core de-identification engine where data can be moved safely uh, in a manner that the re-identification risk is measurable. Um, it can be monitored. At the same time, the value and the utility of the data is not lost. Otherwise, critical features are lost and many of the data science algorithms become quite useless. So that's kind of something to think about. This is the broad underlying structure uh, of some of this. and. and you know, in a in subsequent uh, webinar come January, we'll kind of dig deeper into the intuition behind each of these and how you want to kind of easily adopt some of this. Um, and, and I think that it's no longer, de-identification is no longer about a few researchers using a tool and de-identifying data, but it is it is front, square, and center part of large-scale enterprise data management. There's another dimension of de-identification that you'll also have to think about is how do you deal with large data sets? And how do you deal with the identification when you have huge data sets? And then how do you kind of do it in a decentralized manner and kind of, you know, like almost like a map reduced version of the identification? Interesting research happening in that area. I want to just close out this example by talking about synthetic data generation. For you, as you think about this, uh, there are three broad buckets, um, you know, and, and we'll, we'll of course share this content with you if any of you are interested. But it's also important to know when to use some of these techniques and when not to. A lot of 
scenarios where you are uh, looking at member enrollment data or provider credential um, or patient visit summary you know typical statistics based techniques where you are kind of replicating the distribution is quite sufficient they are easy to handle uh, and they, they do the job uh, when you are now going beyond a snapshot data and you want to for example create a claims journey or you know a pre authorization journey or a patient journey and you want to kind of create synthetic data around that you have to think about more sophisticated simulation based techniques and we're doing some interesting work with open source frameworks like cynthia uh, and and enabling uh, you know some of the software development work that's happening in and around uh, synthetic data we are also helping customers on this topic because there are new areas that they're entering where they may not have reference data then how do you kind of design and validate and build your you know digital platforms when you don't have reference data yourself so that's another use case for synthetic synthetic data last one of course is you are dealing with more difficult data like images and notes then then of course you go down the path of really complex algorithms like can which are not only computationally expensive but extremely hard to interpret so i just wanted to kind of make give you the intuition that there is a whole range of techniques available there is quite a bit of things that you can do that serves 90% of the uh, use cases and, and making considerable progress in that area so this is the four examples we wanted to share with you um, there's of course more reference architectures and details yeah take some details. questions uh, yes there are a lot of questions flowing in and if you can keep the last slide uh, up so that you know uh, uh, folks can also email the questions to us so if you can uh, switch to the last slide thank you Sridhar so uh, Sridhar and Swan and I'll probably you know, in the interest of time we'll probably be able to take only two or three questions and participants uh, you can note down the two email IDs at the bottom of this slide and you can uh, you know, feel free to send us uh, you know questions uh, offline and we'll try to respond to as many questions as possible and uh, you know let us know if we can help you in any ways to design your uh, next generation data management strategy all right so one of the question is uh, do the data management tools provide direct insight or solutions or do they provide an output that can be fed into an analytics platform to be consumed so I'll just repeat the question, uh, do the data management tools provide direct insights or do they provide an output that can be fed into an analytics platform to be consumed? Yeah, um, I'll take a first crack at it and Swanan, please add. Um, yeah, so the, the reality is, so if I were to answer this question seven years from now, I would say yes, but the reality is that you know the maturity of many of these platforms to support uh, you know extraction of some of these complex data sets as well as serve some of these use cases particularly in healthcare is is very limited um, you know as we are all common uh, you know passengers in this journey you know healthcare data sets have a lot more you know context and, and in some ways have a lot more linkages than other industries so 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 the simple answer to your question is that at least the examples that we talked about um, you know you you are in some ways um, in the short term required to assemble the components but uh, one thing I as I reiterated at every point is that you want to design them to fit into your existing uh, data management you know investment that you've made uh, it, it, they, I at least do not think of one use case today where you need to, they, of course there are edge cases, but where you need to lock, stock and barrel replace that to generate these using insights. A lot of these algorithms can be plugged in and kind of enhanced what you have today. But I, I, I think majority of what we talked about today, you have to leverage, uh, you know, data science libraries to get what you're looking for. So Anand, if you want to add something, please. So. Yeah, what you said is right. I, mean, I haven't seen it. There are many tools which claim that, but uh, essentially what happens is they will give you some algorithms or maybe some libraries for that. But uh, it's not a direct. And you still have to you know, train your algorithms. You still have to give it, feed it the data, see data, see what it gives you back. And only then uh, things start moving. It's not that uh, I take a tool and then 
no, it starts spinning everything else around. Mm. That's that's not something that happens, or at least I don't think it, I don't think it will happen so soon. Yeah, Manisha. All right, so guys, uh, I think we'll have to end our session now. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining this uh, session, and uh, you know we couldn't take a lot of questions live, but we have noted down all your questions, and you know we'll respond to each one of the participants offline. Thank you.